In a couple of previous videos, whose links are given in the description, we saw that the concept of natural numbers emerges naturally as an abstraction from the nature of discrete things like persons, apples, pebbles, etc. and the fact that multiple of them can exist with no conceptual upper bound in their number, if we neglect physical limitations. We also discussed continuous quantities like distance, time, mass, volume, intensity, and so on. In order to measure such a quantity, we first need to choose an arbitrary amount of it and designate it as a unit. For example, a foot, a day, a liter, a kilogram, etc. Then, the procedure of measurement is essentially a comparison against this unit. We would like to consider the result of this comparison as a number. It is essentially the analogy or ratio of our given amount compared to the unit. The most straightforward case is that where our given amount is a perfectly integer multiple of the unit, for example, 2 feet, 3 days or 5 kilograms. In such cases, we simply consider the measure of our amount to be the corresponding natural number. But if the unit does not fit perfectly into our amount, then things are more complicated. Since the natural numbers are a concept that we are innately familiar with, we can use them to construct a derivative number system for continuous quantities where the unit is split into an integer number of subunits. For example, an inch is a twelfth of a foot, an hour is one twenty-fourth of a day, and a gram is a thousandth of a kilogram. But there are no restrictions in our choice of subunit. We can divide the unit into as many subunits as we wish. The possible subunits are as many as the natural numbers, infinite. Then, instead of comparing our given amount against the unit, we compare it against some subunit. Our goal is to choose a suitable subunit such that the ratio of our amount to that subunit is an integer, or to say it differently, such that the subunit fits into our amount an integer number of times. If the chosen subunit is one nth of the unit, i.e. equal to 1 over n, and it fits m times into our amount, then the proportion of our amount compared to the unit is what we call the rational number m over n. Since the subunits can be arbitrarily small, and there are infinitely many from which to choose, it may seem that any arbitrary amount of some quantity can be precisely decomposed into subunits, and hence that the rational number system can describe the analogy between any arbitrary amount of a quantity and any chosen unit of that quantity. This is in fact what the Pythagoreans originally believed. They believed that there is a unified harmony in nature where all analogies can be expressed as integer ratios. The mystical scaffold of the universe is the natural numbers. However, it turned out that this is not the case and it was the Pythagoreans themselves who discovered it. In this video, we will trace the history of this discovery. Some of the resources used are listed on the screen. Of particular interest is the first one, a 1945 academic paper by a German philologist named Kurt von Fritz. Kurt von Fritz was a remarkable person, and since the present video has a historical perspective, it is only fair that we begin with mentioning briefly some biographical details about him. He was born on the 25th of August 1900 and died on the 16th of July 1985. He was a German professor of classical philology. He came from a military family and although he also had an interest for philosophy, mathematics and science, he was eventually won over by classics when he heard a lecture by Edward Schwartz in 1919 on the Greek historian Thucydides who described the fall from civilization to barbarism during the Peloponnesian War. It seems that Kurt von Fritz valued human persons and their relationships more than the marvels of the inanimate universe, and in classics he found the childhood of modern culture, which was crucial for its shaping. But, being adept in mathematics, he was very suitable to undertake the task of presenting the history of the discovery of the irrationals, doing some detective work in the process in order to clarify some details that were disputed. His intellectual energy and vision was matched by his morality. In 1933, he received an associate professorship for Greek at the University of Rostock, his first, but with the rise of the Nazi party to power, 
every employee of the German government was required to sign an oath to Adolf Hitler. He refused, he was only one of two professors to do so, and hence was suspended and eventually removed from his position. In fact, he was thereafter denied any possibility of working as an academic in Germany under that regime. In 1936, he went to Oxford and in the same year traveled to the USA where he taught mostly at Columbia University until he returned to Germany in 1954 to teach at the Free University of Berlin and from 1958 onwards at the University of Munich. The second character that we need to succinctly introduce is the far more ancient figure Pythagoras. The revelation of irrational numbers is credited to the philosophers of the Pythagorean school. Moreover, the number most renowned for being irrational is the square root of 2, which arises organically in relation to the Pythagorean theorem. These facts may give the impression that Pythagoras was a great mathematician. However, this does not appear to have been the case. Yet his successors did develop mastery of mathematics motivated by the school founder's attribution of mystical significance to numbers. Pythagoras was a very important ancient philosopher who had great influence on ancient philosophy, through which he left an imprint on the Western civilization up to the modern era. Unfortunately, information about him is rather scarce, most of it coming from later writers, recorded many centuries after his death and polluted with legends. Indeed, Pythagoras made a deep impression on the ancient world, acquiring a mythical status and a reputation for being a wonder worker and having supernatural abilities. For example, he supposedly had a golden thigh, he was associated or even identified with the god Apollo, he had a magical golden arrow given to him by Abaris, the Hyperborean shaman, which allowed him to fly to distant places, and he allegedly was seen simultaneously at two different cities, one in southern Italy and one in Sicily, conversing with friends. Many discoveries or theories of his successors or other later ancient philosophers were attributed to him. Nevertheless, from the various accounts, we can piece together a rough credible biography. He was born in the Greek island of Samos at about 570 BC. He was the son of Nisarchos, a gem engraver, and Pythais, a woman belonging to an aristocratic family of the island. At that time, the art of gem engraving was at the forefront of technology and going through a revolutionary phase with many innovations taking place, and the Greeks likely learned the new techniques from the Phoenicians, with whom they were in contact in Cyprus. Pythagoras's father and Pythagoras himself likely traveled to foreign lands such as Egypt and Phoenicia to learn about the new techniques and engage in commerce. This brought Pythagoras into contact with the wisdom of other cultures and stimulated his inquiring spirit. Furthermore, just across the sea from Samos there was the important intellectual hub of Miletos, which had recently become the site of origin of the Greek philosophical and scientific tradition, a tradition that quickly spread to other parts of Asia Minor and of the Greek world in general and certainly to nearby Samos. Philosophers such as Thales, Anaximander and Anaximenes were the first to attribute phenomena to natural rather than supernatural causes and proposed that the world is structured from some single ultimate substance, holding different views as to which element that might be, among those proposed being water, air, fire and an indefinite substance called apiron. But Samos itself was also one of the most advanced places of the Greek world of that era, with technological achievements such as the Epalinian Aqueduct and the Temple of Hera. Pythagoras initiated some philosophical activity in Samos, gathering students and forming an intellectual circle, already gaining fame in the Greek world. However, it seems that he wasn't on the best of terms with the tyrant of Samos, Polycrates, which resulted in his migrating to the city of Croton, in what is now southern Italy and was at that time part of a region later called Megali Elas or Magna Graecia in Latin, which means Greater Greece. Starting from a couple of centuries prior, the Greeks had established a large number of colonies in southern Italy and Sicily, which during the time of Pythagoras and the ensuing century an era when the Pythagoreans were very influential in the region, were very prosperous and culturally and economically advanced, 
which is likely why this region was named Greater Greece. Pythagoras' migration to Croton took place around 530 BC when Pythagoras was about 40 years old. When Pythagoras arrived in Croton, the morale of its citizens was very low as they had recently been defeated with heavy losses by the Locrians at the Battle of the Sagras River, despite outnumbering them by a large margin. Pythagoras, already highly reputed as a sophos, a wise person, when he arrived, managed to boost the morale by praising and highlighting the merits of a simple, non-luxurious life that focuses on the cultivation of virtue, reforming or reintroducing cultural and religious institutions of the older Greek civilization. He became highly influential as the city's authorities invited him to hold a series of seminars towards separate groups of boys, young men, girls and married women. Pythagoras' activity had a positive effect on the people of Croton and their city flourished in the years that followed, forming a sort of hegemony among the neighboring Greek city-states while Pythagoras himself gained much influence and power. However, he also formed a closed privileged society or brotherhood of elite young members. They formed an exclusive club with strict rules of conduct, rituals and a somewhat communal way of life. The members of this brotherhood later occupied places of power in society and in the city governance as they came from elite families. Thus, the Pythagoreans gradually obtained much power and influence in Magna Graecia. This eventually led to suspicion, jealousy and animosity in the general population, with several movements or revolts taking place against them, the first of which took place when Pythagoras was still alive in old age, which forced him to leave Croton and move to nearby Metapondum, where he stayed for a short period until his death. What was Pythagoras famous for in the ancient world? Was he regarded as a great mathematician like most modern people assume him to have been? The answer is no. Rather, Pythagoras was known for the following. First of all, he was considered to be an expert on the fate of the soul after death. Pythagoras taught that the soul is immortal and that after death it transmigrates into another body, whether human or animal. Possibly, its soul's transmigrational path is determined by how it lived its previous lives, undergoing judgment after its death, hence the need for a particular virtuous way of life called Pythagorean life. The doctrine about judgment is not explicitly mentioned as a Pythagorean teaching in our available sources, but it is found in the Orphic religion and in Plato's philosophy, both of which have close similarities with the Pythagorean beliefs and are most likely related. So, Pythagoras was also famous as a teacher of a way of life. In the ancient world, philosophy was not restricted to an academic theoretical discipline, but it was much wider in scope and was also practical in nature, aiming to discover and apply the way of life that leads to fulfillment. It had to do with the meaning of the human life. As such, it was more holistic than the modern concept of philosophy, incorporating many elements that would today be classified as religious or spiritual. Pythagoras placed emphasis on sacred religious rituals, abstention from certain kinds of foods, ritual purity and even on certain prohibitions and regulations that may seem meaningless and puzzling to us, such as that one should always put on the right sandal before the left one. Presumably, this way of life was designed to purify the individual that abides by it and help them to accomplish progress in the perpetual cycle of reincarnations. Interestingly, Pythagoras did not discriminate as much between men and women, contrary to the norm in the ancient world, and there were several women among the Pythagorean philosophers. The Pythagorean belief and life system was probably not something completely novel, but a refinement or reformation and systematization of earlier Greek traditions, particularly those related to the Orphic religion. Finally, what is of particular importance for the present topic is Pythagoras' fascination and obsession with numbers. He did not, however, seem interested in them from a purely mathematical perspective, but rather from a cosmological perspective, believing them to be fundamental elements of the world that we live in. Aristotle went as far as to claim that the Pythagoreans believed that all things are numbers, 
in a similar sense that, for example, other philosophers of that time believed all things to consist of water, air or fire. But this is likely an exaggeration. What Pythagoras and his followers likely believed was that numbers are part of the deepest nature of things, with everything having a mystical resemblance or something in common with a number or with a ratio of numbers, and that numbers and the ratios in some sense explain or govern things. They found some empirical evidence to support this belief in the observation that the central musical concords, the octave, the fifth and the fourth, originally defined empirically from the way they sound to our ears, correspond to integer ratios of lengths in the instruments that produce them, for example the length of a chord, the thickness of a disc, etc. Given that music itself was regarded very highly in Greek culture and often considered to have some connection to the divine realm, this reinforced the Pythagoreans' conviction in the mystical power and significance of numbers. They went on to postulate that since sound is related to motion, the motion of the stars and planets, governed by mathematical ratios, is associated with an inaudible music of the heavens. Concerning the Pythagorean theorem, it is unlikely that Pythagoras produced any formal proof of it. Rigorous mathematics had not yet begun to develop in Greece, although they would shortly after Pythagoras' prime. However, the truth of the theorem was empirically known as an arithmetic technique without proof to civilizations of the Middle East such as the Babylonians, and it is likely that Pythagoras came to know of it. Probably the truth of the theorem was not known in its general form, but for specific triangles of integer sides. For example, the simplest such right triangle has sides of 3, 4 and 5 units. By the way, triplets of integers that can be the sides of a right triangle are called Pythagorean triples and the corresponding right triangles are called Pythagorean triangles. In arbitrary cases, one could make imprecise measurements which nevertheless hinted to the general validity of the theorem. So, it is possible that Pythagoras became aware of the truth of the theorem without being able to prove it formally. It is said that upon discovery of this fact, Pythagoras was elated and sacrificed oxen to the gods in gratitude, likely perceiving it as further evidence of the mystical significance of numbers and their fundamental role as constituents of the fabric of the universe. So, the engagement of early Pythagoreans with numbers was more akin to mysticism rather than mathematics. For example, they likened the female to the number 2 and the male to the number 3, while their sum 5 was likened to marriage. The tetractis, which literally means the four, means the group of the first four numbers, 1, 2, 3 and 4, which when added together equal the number 10, thought of as the perfect number. They are also the numbers making up the ratios of the basic concords in music. The tetractis was thus an important sacred symbol in Pythagoreanism. To summarize, Pythagoras' cosmos was one that had a moral purpose, exhibited in the immortality of the soul, reincarnation and judgment but it also embodied mathematical relationships, not as a separate aspect, but somehow as one with the moral. This confusion between the realms of ethics and logic is to some degree inherent also in the philosophy of Plato. To me, this does not seem like a viable marriage, and hence eventually, in the modern Western world, the aspect of logic and mathematics seems to have taken the upper hand, while the soul and ethics have been demoted from the status of fundamental to something derivative, to products of the physical world. Indeed, in modern Western developed societies, the prevalent worldview among intellectuals is physicalism, which is the view that everything is ultimately explainable by physics. The world consists of fundamental physical particles that interact with each other according to certain laws, the laws of physics, and everything that we as humans perceive macroscopically can be explained according to these laws even things such as consciousness, human life and their associated aspects of life such as right and wrong, good and evil. Personally, I do not embrace this view, but this can be a topic for another video. If we measure Pythagoras' views against this prevalent modern view, they seem at first glance to be antithetical. Pythagoras' teachings about the immortality of the soul and about the transmigration of souls hints at a dualistic understanding of reality. Dualism is a competitor of philosophical theory to physicalism 
which holds that human persons and mental phenomena or aspects of them are beyond the realm of physics. They are non-physical and immaterial. Personally, I feel much more at home with this dualistic worldview and I consider it to be much closer to the truth than physicalism or materialism. But Pythagoras' other tenet, that all things are number, if we trust Aristotle that this is what the Pythagoreans actually believed, although as we said this is likely an exaggeration, and if all things include the soul and its realm, seems more in line with physicalism. Indeed, while numbers and the realm of mathematics in general is something immaterial, and hence the claim that all things are number may not sit well with materialists, nevertheless, numbers are also inanimate and impersonal. Hence, Pythagoras' theory, or Aristotle's depiction of it, in common with physicalism and materialism, assumes primacy and fundamentality of the impersonal over the personal. It seems to claim that a person is something composite, composed of more fundamental, impersonal, lifeless constituents, organized in a certain way, and that impersonal, lifeless principles are the source of everything. Furthermore, the foundational role of mathematics is shared also by physicalism, because if physics governs everything, then mathematics, which constitutes the character of the physical laws, is a large part of that governance. The physical laws are mathematical in nature, And hence, if physics is everything, then it is also true in a sense that mathematics is everything as well. So, even though Pythagoreanism may sound alien to a modern person, it does contain seeds of what would become the modern worldview. So far, we have portrayed Pythagoras as primarily a figure of religious and ethical significance, one who founded a way of life. In his worldview, Numbers had a mystical significance tied to the true nature of things. However, later Pythagoreans, like Hippasus, Philolaus and Archytas, made important contributions to science and mathematics. How did this come about? Was it a development from the original philosophy of Pythagoras? After Pythagoras passed away, there seems to have been some sort of rift within the Pythagorean community. Two factions emerged, the Akousmatiki, the listeners, and the mathematici, the learners. The former placed great emphasis on the spiritual, mystical and ritualistic aspects of Pythagoreanism. They believed that adherence to the Pythagorean rules of life, ethical conduct and religious practices, as encapsulated in the akousmata, which were short, cryptic sayings or aphorisms attributed to Pythagoras, is the path to achieving fulfillment and realizing the purpose of human life. They were people of a religious and dogmatic mindset. To them, truth was something that is mostly revealed by divine inspiration rather than discovered by intellectual effort. The fruits of the latter are mundane, not divine, and not worth dedicating one's full efforts. The mathematici, on the other hand, had a more inquiring spirit and engaged in mathematics and cosmology. They did not renounce the teaching of Pythagoras. They too believed that numbers have a mystical significance and accepted the truth of the Akousmata. However, their belief in the mystical significance of numbers motivated them to explore the mechanics of numbers further through mathematical contemplation. To them, the advancement of mathematical knowledge through the intellect was not contrary to the spirit of Pythagoras, but rather in line with it. They believed that Pythagoras gave the Akousmata as an ethical guide to those people who were simple-minded or did not have time or interest to engage in deeper philosophy but that Pythagoras himself did encourage and engage in intellectual inquiry in the same way as they did. Hence, this branch of Pythagoreanism did contribute significantly to the development of mathematics and cosmology. The Akousmatiki regarded the Mathematiki as not Pythagorean at all, replacing the divine revelations with mundane human knowledge. The Mathematiki, on the other hand, did recognize the Akousmatiki as Pythagoreans, but looked down on them as ones who did not have the capacity to understand the depth of Pythagoras' teachings or spirit, and therefore had to be given the Pythagorean ethical education in the form of dogmas. The figure of most interest for our topic is Hippasus of Metapondion, or Metapondum in Latin, the city of southern Italy where Pythagoras spent his last days. He was an early Pythagorean who was active during the first half of the 5th century and was possibly the first of the Mathematici, 
In any case, he's the first Pythagorean for whom we can be reasonably confident that he was a natural philosopher and a mathematician. Unfortunately, our knowledge about him is relatively limited and he is not known to have written any books. He seems to have shared the belief with Heraclitus that fire is the primary element and to have regarded the soul as also made of fire. He also probably conducted some experimental research in music that verified the relationship between the central musical concords and whole number ratios of lengths in the musical instruments that produce the sounds. According to the aforementioned Kurt von Fritz, he is the most likely candidate to have discovered incommensurability. This was a shocking discovery that meant that there is no common substrate of natural numbers describing everything in the universe, contrary to what was the Pythagorean belief at the time. Hence the later legends according to which Hippasus drowned in the sea as divine punishment for revealing this knowledge, or according to another version for making known the secret knowledge of the construction of the dodecahedron. When we speak of incommensurability and of irrational numbers, we essentially mean the same thing. Two quantities are said to be commensurable when there is a third, smaller quantity that fits inside each of them an integer number of times and thus can be considered to be a common measure of them. If such a common measure of them can be found, then the ratio of these two quantities is a rational number. And conversely, if the ratio of two quantities is a rational number, then a common measure of them can be found. To see this, consider two quantities, say two lengths a and b, which have a common measure c and are thus commensurable. This means that c fits perfectly into a an integer number of times, as it does also into b. In more mathematical language, there exist integers n and m, such that a equals n times c and b equals m times c. This means that the ratio of the two quantities, a over b, equals n over m, which is a rational number. Conversely, suppose that the ratio a over b is a rational number, i.e. a over b equals n over m, where n and m are integers. Then consider the quantity c equals a over n, which is obtained by splitting a into n equal parts and taking one of them. By definition then, c is a measure of a, as it fits perfectly into it an integer number of times, n times in particular. But then, by virtue of a over b being equal to n over m, c turns out to be a measure of b as well. Indeed, it turns out that b equals m times c. c fits perfectly into b an integer number of times, namely m times. This means that a and b are commensurable with c being a common measure. Hence the conclusion is that if two quantities are commensurable, then their ratio is a rational number and vice versa. Initially, the Pythagoreans did not suspect that there could be incommensurable quantities. They believed that the properties and essence of things are determined by ratios, or logi, of natural numbers, like in the case of the musical concords. Knowledge of these logi, or ratios, was assumed to give a deeper insight into the true nature of reality, and hence the Pythagoreans were bound to try to discover these fundamental ratios in any phenomenon or perceived object of importance in the world of the senses. As Kurt von Fritz pointed out, logos means word or speech in Greek, but not just any kind of word or speech, but one that conveys significant meaning or insight. This is where the word logic comes from. Hence, through the Pythagoreans, logos also came to mean ratio because they thought that these ratios capture the essence of the things in which they are inherent. The discovery of incommensurability was not recorded in contemporary sources. However, there are some clues that enable us to trace it. Firstly, we know that it was made after the time of Pythagoras, since Pythagoras thought that the natures of all things can be expressed through natural numbers. But in Plato's dialogue Theaetetus, we find also an upper limit for the date of the discovery. Theaetetus was an Athenian mathematician, a friend of Plato, who also happened to make significant contributions to the field of irrational numbers, recorded in Book 10 of Euclid's Elements. In the preface of Plato's dialogue, 
Another Euclid, a student of Socrates from Megara, is telling his friend, Terpsion, that he just saw Thetitos being brought back to Athens from a battle at Corinth in which he was wounded. He apparently later died from his wounds. The two men praise the personal qualities of Thetitos and Euclid recalls that Socrates had narrated to him a discussion that he had with Thetitos and the famous mathematician Theodorus of Kyrene, a Greek colony in North Africa in modern-day Libya. This discussion had taken place not long before Socrates' death when Thetitos was a young man of 17 years old, and Theodorus was an old man. Since Socrates died in 399 BC, the discussion cannot have taken place later than that date. The dialogue records Thetitos as having said to Socrates. Theodorus here was drawing some figures for us in illustration of roots, showing that squares containing 3 square feet and 5 square feet are not commensurable in length with the unit of the foot, and so on, taking them one by one up to the square containing 17 square feet. And at that, for some reason, he stopped. Now, it occurred to us, since the number of roots appear to be infinite, to try to collect them into one group by which we can assign them a name. What Thetitos is saying here is that Theodorus was demonstrating to them that the sides of squares with areas of 3, 5, 6, etc. up to 17 square feet, obviously 9 and 16 are excluded, which equal the square root of 3, square root of 5, etc. up to the square root of 17 feet, respectively, are incommensurable with the length of one foot. In other words, he is saying that the ratios square root of 3 over 1, square root of 5 over 1, etc. are not rational numbers. In modern mathematical language, we could more simply say that he is saying that the square root of 3, the square root of 5, etc. up to the square root of 17 are not rational numbers. What can this passage tell us about the state of knowledge of ancient Greek mathematics at about 400 BC? On one hand, since Theodorus had to demonstrate the irrationality of the square roots of 3, 5, etc. one by one, this means that a general proof was probably not available, although Theodorus and his fellow students could see or somehow infer that there are in fact infinitely many such irrational roots. On the other hand, it is striking that Theodorus omitted to mention the most famous irrational root, the square root of 2. This implies that by that time, the irrationality of the square root of 2 was a well-known fact not worthy of mention in an advanced lesson on incommensurability. Given that at that time there was no internet and even no typography, and information and knowledge travelled very slowly, this suggests that the discovery of the irrationality of the square root of 2 must have been made a long time prior to that discussion taking place. According to ancient tradition preserved by the philosopher of late antiquity Iamblichus, who lived from 245 to 325 AD, it was Hippasus who discovered incommensurability. Of course, having lived so many centuries later, Iamblichus' testimony is of limited credibility, and in fact, the tradition that he preserves does seem to contain legendary elements, such as that Hippasus died by drowning as a divine punishment for making public the secret Pythagorean knowledge. But part of his information seems to originate in the history of mathematics written by Evdimus of Rhodes, a pupil of Aristotle, who is trustworthy and lived much closer to the time of Hippasus. Unfortunately though, we are not aware of any contemporary source that directly credits Hippasus with this discovery. Hippasus belonged to the generation preceding that of Theodorus of Kyrene, who was the mathematician demonstrating to Thetitos and his fellow students the irrationality of the square roots of 3, 5, etc. Therefore, him being the discoverer of incommensurability would fit well with Plato's story. This would mean that incommensurability was discovered in the middle of the 5th century BC. Some scholars argued for a later date on the basis that Greek mathematics of that time had not yet reached a level of sophistication that would allow such a discovery. For context, that period was the beginning of the classical period of Greece, with the Persian Wars having ended in mainland Greece a few years prior, marking the end of the archaic period. But Kurt von Fritz argues, convincingly in my opinion, 
that neither was Greek mathematics of that era entirely trivial, nor is the level of sophistication needed for discovering incommensurability as great as those other scholars assumed. We can thus attempt, with some speculation, to estimate how this discovery occurred. Let us recall Pythagoras' enthusiasm when he realized the truth of the Pythagorean theorem. At that stage, a formal proof was not available, but imprecise measurements that hinted to the truth of the theorem were possible. A special case concerns right triangles within the Gersides. That the early Pythagoreans had an interest in such triangles is attested by Proclus, whose reference is probably the credible disciple of Aristotle, Evdimus of Rhodes. According to him, early Pythagorean mathematics produced a formula which allows one to find any number of right triangles within the Gersides. That formula is the identity shown, which you can verify using simple algebra, where m is an odd integer. Using this identity, one can obtain infinitely many triples of integers, called Pythagorean triples, of the form m, m squared minus 1 divided by 2, and m squared plus 1 divided by 2, the sum of the squares of the first two being equal to the square of the third. Now Proclus, probably using Evdimus as his source, claims that the early Pythagoreans used this formula to discover right triangles with integer sides. But the formula itself has nothing to do with triangles. All it tells us is how to find triples of integers, a, b, c, say, such that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. It is therefore suggested that the Pythagoreans somehow knew that Pythagorean triples, when interpreted as the lengths of the sides of a triangle, give rise to a right triangle. This is in fact the converse of the Pythagorean theorem. Whereas the Pythagorean theorem tells us that if there is a right triangle with legs of lengths a and b and hypotenuse of length c, then a squared plus b squared equals c squared, the converse of the Pythagorean theorem tells us that if a squared plus b squared equals c squared, then we can draw a right triangle with legs and hypotenuse of lengths a, b and c respectively. The Pythagoreans may have known the truth of the converse Pythagorean theorem empirically through imprecise drawings or they may have produced some sort of proof. I have made a separate video devoted to the converse Pythagorean theorem where a proof is presented. Let us consider the simplest Pythagorean triple consisting of the numbers 3, 4 and 5 and let us draw the corresponding right triangle. Each sides have lengths of 3, 4 and 5 units. But what units is that? Is it centimeters, feet, miles? Does it matter? Actually, it does not matter at all. Choosing different units simply scales the triangle up or down, but the proportions of the sides remain the same and hence the geometry is preserved and the triangle remains a right triangle. To emphasize this, let us choose the length of the hypotenuse as the unit. In other words, let us make lengths non-dimensional by dividing them by the length of 5 units, whatever they may be, of the hypotenuse. We thus obtain a dimensionless master triangle to which all such dimensional triangles are similar. Whatever relation therefore holds for the master triangle, holds for all of them. So, as we can see, in all of these triangles, the perpendicular sides are 3 fifths and 4 fifths of the hypotenuse respectively. According to the Pythagorean belief that everything in nature is governed by integer ratios, this observation, and the fact that the right triangle is a special kind of triangle, adds to the significance of the ratios 3 fifths and 4 fifths. They seem to be more special now that we know that they govern the proportions of a type of right triangle. Their status in the mystical hierarchy of numerical ratios that underlies the universe is upgraded. But this particular right triangle, important though it may have been to the Pythagoreans, as all right triangles, is not the most fundamental one. The most basic right triangle is the isosceles right triangle. Surely then, the ratio that underlies the relationship of the leg to the hypotenuse of that triangle is even more fundamental. But what is that ratio, that logos? Given the interest of the Pythagoreans in right triangles, and that they most likely regarded the isosceles one as a mathematical object of mystical significance, it seems almost certain that they attempted to find out. But the isosceles right triangle eludes their formula for the generation of Pythagorean triples. 
there is no integer for which the lengths of the two legs in that formula are equal. Therefore, a deeper investigation was needed. If we assume that the leg to hypotenuse ratio is equal to m over n, where m and n are integers, and assuming that the Pythagorean theorem holds for this triangle as well, a fact that the Pythagoreans may not have known for sure but likely suspected, then we arrive at the required relationship between these two integers, n squared equals 2 times m squared. Therefore, the task becomes that of finding two integers that satisfy this relation. It turns out, however, that no two such integers exist. The equation is impossible to satisfy with integers. What does this mean? It means that the proportion between the leg and the hypotenuse of an isosceles right triangle is not equal to any integer ratio. In fact, it equals what in modern mathematical language is the reciprocal of the square root of 2, which is an irrational number. To show that no two integers exist that satisfy this equation, we can follow Euclid, who, in an appendix of the 10th book of his work titled Elements, presents the earliest known proof that the square root of 2 is irrational. Alternative proofs can be found in my video on irrational numbers. It is a proof by contradiction whereby one begins by assuming that the sought integers exist and arrives at an absurd conclusion. Let n and m be integers that satisfy this equation. By rearranging the equation we can see that if n and m have any common factors, then we can cancel them out and the equation continues to be satisfied by the remaining factors of n and m. So, let us decide that all such cancellations have been performed beforehand, so that n and m have no common divisor. Now, since the right-hand side of this equation, 2 times m squared, is an even integer because of the factor 2, the left-hand side, n squared, is also even, and this can only be true if n is even, since the squares of odd integers are odd. So, let n equal 2 times p for some integer p and substitute this in our main equation to get m squared equals 2 times p squared. But this is of exactly the same form as our original equation and it similarly implies that m is even. But then both integers n and m are even, which makes it impossible that they have no common factor, contrary to our initial assumption, since they are both divisible by 2. We have therefore reached a contradiction. Hence, it is impossible to find relatively prime integers n and m such that our equation is satisfied. This means that the length of the leg of an isosceles right triangle is no rational fraction of the length of the hypotenuse. The ratio or logos is not equal to a ratio of integers. Therefore, the leg and the hypotenuse are incommensurable. Given the interest of the Pythagoreans in odd and even integers, this proof seems quite within their reach. So this is a possible path that may have led the Pythagoreans to the discovery that not all proportions or logi can be expressed as ratios of integers, i.e. to the discovery that an attribute exhibited by our reality is incommensurability. However, some modern scholars raised an objection. This path passes through the Pythagorean theorem which was unlikely to be known in the days of the early Pythagoreans. Euclid's Elements, which contains both a proof of the Pythagorean theorem and a proof of the irrationality of the square root of 2, were written at about 300 BC, two centuries after the time of Pythagoras, and more than 150 years after Hippasus is stipulated to have discovered incommensurability, although the proof of the irrationality of the square root of 2 is also hinted at and assumed to be widely known by Aristotle in his prior analytics written at about 350 BC. Hence, those modern scholars propose a later date for the discovery, perhaps in the 4th century. But, as von Fritz noted, this objection is weak. On the one hand, the Pythagoreans likely suspected the truth of the Pythagorean theorem, even if they did not know of a formal proof, and that is all that was needed. And on the other hand, only a limited version of this theorem was needed, applicable to the special case of an isosceles triangle, the truth of which is almost immediately obvious by inspection when one draws such a triangle and the squares of its sides. Let us see this. Consider the isosceles right triangle shown with leg A and hypotenuse C. Draw the squares of the two legs and of the hypotenuse, 
The former have area A squared each and the latter has area C squared. Now draw one diagonal in each of the squares of the legs and both diagonals in the square of the hypotenuse. This splits the square of each leg into two triangles and the square of the hypotenuse into four triangles. Each of these triangles can be seen to be equal or congruent to our original triangle. Each of them is an isosceles right triangle and for each pair of them we can identify and match the lengths of their legs or their hypotenuses. So obviously the total area of the squares of the two legs is equal to four triangles but the area of the square of the hypotenuse is also equal to four triangles. And this is just the Pythagorean theorem for this special case. It is almost immediately obvious by inspection and so poses no real obstacle along the aforementioned possible path to the discovery of incommensurability by the Pythagoreans. So this is a path that may have likely led to the discovery of incommensurability. But von Fried suggested another possible path and his suggestion is quite interesting. It has to do with the method of mutual subtraction and with an investigation of the properties of the regular pentagon. According to ancient tradition, Hippasus was interested in the properties of the dodecahedron and by extension to those of the pentagon which is the shape of the dodecahedron's faces. Furthermore, the pentagram, which is formed by extending the edges of a pentagon to the point of intersection, was used by the Pythagoreans as a token of mutual recognition and as a symbol of well-being and of good deeds. How could the Pentagon have been the starting point for the discovery of incommensurability? Well, firstly, being a geometric shape of outstanding significance, the Pythagoreans must have thought that the ratio of its side to its diagonal must be a special logos, just like for the ratio of the leg to the hypotenuse of an isosceles right triangle, and they must have felt compelled to discover what this ratio is. The standard method used for finding a common measure of two lengths was the method of mutual subtraction known by craftsmen as a rule of thumb long before the time of Pythagoras. For example, suppose that you must cover a rectangular area by square tiles. What size should the tiles be in order to fit perfectly into the rectangle? The side of the tile should fit an integer number of times into both the length and the height of the rectangle. In other words, the size of the tile should be a common measure of both sides of the rectangle. The method of mutual subtraction can be used to solve this problem and find an appropriate tile size. It is the basis for Euclid's algorithm for finding the greatest common divisor of two integers. The gist is the observation that if the tile side A is a common measure of both the length L and height H of the rectangle, then it is also a measure of their difference L minus H. Indeed, suppose that A is a common measure of L and H. Then L and H are multiples of A, but it turns out that so is their difference. In these expressions, M and N are integers since A divides both L and H, and therefore M minus N is also an integer and hence A divides also L minus H. In other words, any common measure of two lengths is also a common measure of their difference. How does this help us? Well, instead of trying to find the greatest common measure of the sides of the rectangle, we can try to find the greatest common measure of the smallest side and the difference between the two sides, as this would be guaranteed to be also a common measure of the other side. Indeed, if A is a common measure of H and of L minus H, then it is also a common measure of L. We thus reduce the problem to finding the common measure of a pair of lengths that are smaller than the original pair. Let us apply this procedure in practice to find the common measure of the sides of the rectangle. We start by comparing the lengths of the sides. One of them is greater than the other, so we measure the difference. Now we have three lengths, the two sides and their difference. We pick the two smallest and repeat the same procedure. Compare the lengths and take their difference as a third length. Again, we take the two smallest of the three and repeat. And repeat again for the fourth time. At the end of this fourth step, the two smallest lengths we end up with are equal. 
Hence, in the fifth step, their difference would be zero and the algorithm could not proceed further. But notice that, due to the equation shown, the first two lengths of all steps have exactly the same common measures. In going from one step to the next one, or to the previous one, no common measures are introduced or removed. In the last step, where the two lengths are equal, it is obvious that they are their mutual common measure. But then, this length is a common measure of all lengths encountered in all previous steps, including the sides of the rectangle that we started with. We can thus choose it as the size of our square tiles. Notice also that since the common measures of the first step are exactly the same as those of the last step, there cannot be any common measure larger than the length we ended up with on the last step. In particular, the length arrived at by our procedure is the largest common measure of the original lengths, and all other smaller common measures are integer subdivisions of the largest common measure. Thus, by splitting the latter into two, three, etc. equal parts, we can make smaller tiles or even non-square tiles if we choose different common measures as their sides. Is this procedure guaranteed to produce the greatest common measure of two lengths in a finite number of steps? The answer is yes, provided that the two lengths do have a common measure. To see this, suppose that they do, and let us denote it by A. Notice that, at each step of the mutual subtraction algorithm, the subtraction reduces the larger of the two lengths by a multiple of A, in particular it reduces it by the smaller of the two lengths, which is a multiple of A. Since each step of our procedure causes a reduction of the lengths by at least A, the lengths are bound to reduce to zero in a finite number of steps, to be more precise in at most m steps, where m is the integer appearing in the top left equation. In Euclid's algorithm for finding the greatest common divisor of two integer numbers, we know that they at least have the number one as a common measure, since they are both integers, and therefore the algorithm is bound to return a result in a finite number of steps. But if the two quantities are arbitrary, is the algorithm bound to finish in a finite number of steps? Well, if all quantities in the universe have some common measure, as the early Pythagoreans believed, then yes, the algorithm is bound to finish in a finite number of steps, as we just explained. But what if it turns out that this algorithm, for some pair of quantities, does not finish in a finite number of steps? Well, necessarily, this would mean that these quantities have no common measure and the early Pythagoreans were wrong, after all. Now, let us consider the likely scenario that Hippasus, when studying the properties of the regular pentagon, decided to try to determine the ratio of the pentagon's diagonal to its side, believing it to be some important logos. He would have used the method of mutual subtraction to determine this logos. Let us see where this path would have led him. First, let us draw two diagonals from the same vertex to divide the pentagon into three triangles. The angles of each triangle sum to 180 degrees, hence the angles of all the triangles sum together, which equal the sum of all interior angles of the pentagon, is equal to 3 times 180, which equals 540 degrees. Hence, each of the five internal angles of the pentagon equals 540 divided by 5, or 108 degrees. Now let us draw all the diagonals of the pentagon with two emanating from each vertex. This splits each internal angle into one angle named alpha between the diagonals and two angles named beta on either side. The diagonals form a pentagram and in the middle of the figure we can see, highlighted, another pentagon. We know that it is a regular pentagon because due to symmetry all its angles and all its sides are equal. Therefore, we know that its internal angles equal 108 degrees each. From this, we can deduce that the base angles of the isosceles triangle AD' C' equal 72 degrees, and hence the remaining angle alpha equals 36 degrees. To determine the angle beta, let us consider the internal angle A at the top of our pentagon. Since it equals 108 degrees, and it also equals 2 times beta plus alpha, where alpha equals 36 degrees, beta also turns out to equal 36 degrees. The two angles happen to be equal, 
So to simplify things, let us get rid of beta and label all angles as alpha. Alpha is equal to a fifth of the straight angle pi and each internal angle of the pentagon equals three times the angle alpha. So with this knowledge, let us begin the mutual subtraction process to determine the largest common measure of the side AB and the diagonal AC of the pentagon. As per the algorithm, we begin by subtracting these two lengths. But first, consider the triangle ABE prime and notice that it is isosceles because the angles at its base B prime are equal. Hence, AB equals AE prime, which is easier to subtract from AC as they lie on the same line. Their difference is CE prime, the yellow segment. But due to symmetry, this is also equal to AD prime, also painted in yellow now. This completes the first step of the algorithm and we are left with three lengths. Let us take the two smallest ones among them and bring them to the next step. The lengths that we take with us are AE prime and AD prime. Again, we subtract them to obtain D prime E prime, the length shown in blue. Once more, take the two smallest lengths, AD prime shown in yellow and D prime E prime shown in blue and go to the third iteration of the algorithm. Pause for a moment and compare the triangles EAD prime and EA prime D prime highlighted in different colors. The former EAD prime is congruent to ABE prime that we saw previously to be isosceles. The latter EA prime D prime due to symmetry has its two sides ED prime and EA prime equal and its hands also isosceles and in fact congruent to EAD prime as they share a leg. Therefore, the two yellow lengths AD prime and A prime D prime are equal, and we can replace the former with the latter in our algorithm. But what do we notice now? We notice that the blue length and the yellow length that are compared in step 3 are, respectively, the side and the diagonal of the smaller pentagon inside the original one. Hence, Step 3 of the mutual subtraction algorithm is about finding the largest common measure of the side and the diagonal of a smaller pentagon. But we have therefore entered a vicious circle, for it is obvious that step 5 will be about finding the common measure of the side and the diagonal of an even smaller pentagon, and step 7 of a pentagon smaller still, and so on to infinity. The mutual subtraction algorithm will therefore never terminate, which, as we saw, means that the side and the diagonal of the pentagon have no common measure. The mathematics involved are not sophisticated and were certainly within the reach of the early Pythagoreans, so this is indeed a possible path that may have led them, or Hippasus in particular, to the surprising discovery of incommensurability. This discovery shattered the Pythagoreans' profound belief that at the core of reality lie integer numbers with the workings of the universe governed by their ratios. Nowadays, we learn about irrational numbers, i.e. about proportions not expressible as ratios of integers, early in our school education, and hence they are taken for granted and their mystery is overlooked. But in the days of the Pythagoreans, when philosophers were like children discovering the world, this discovery made a deep impression. It is perhaps useful for us too to take a second look at things that we unconsciously take for granted and rediscover the beauty and mystery of reality like children. In future videos, we will explore other aspects of reality. Subscribe to the channel if you want to be notified and if you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting the like button to help with the dissemination algorithm. Thank you.